invite you to come with me one more time to Genesis chapter 24. We will read a little bit there in a moment or two. Sometimes I can be a bit cantankerous as a preacher. If you don't know that word, feel free to Google it. But what I mean by it is that um, sometimes I will uh, preach about the birth of Jesus in the middle of July. Sometimes I'll talk about the resurrection of the Lord in a month other than April. And today I will speak from Scripture about the importance of mothers, and it's nowhere near Mother's Day. Sue me. It's an old Spanish proverb. I'm told it goes like this. An ounce of mother is worth a pound of preacher. And I'm sure that's true. But I am going to do my best to bring you something worthwhile from God's word in Genesis chapter 24 this morning. I'm sure we all understand and appreciate that moms have a tough job. One mother was considering her difficult task and she said, I guess if it was going to be easy, it would not have started with something that the doctor called labor. But imagine being in labor at age 90. That's what Sarah went through, remember? And I just sort of marvel at that. No wonder she laughed when she heard it was going to happen. You might as well laugh as cry. And, and no wonder that she named her son what she did, Isaac, laughter. But, but Sarah certainly proved to be up to the task, and she raised a son, Isaac, through whom God funneled incredible blessings that we still partake in even today. Sarah faced uh, a lot. She was tough, and she certainly wasn't to be trifled with. You know, moms aren't to be messed with on some things, especially their children. I'll never forget the story I read. It's been a while back now, but there was this mother, and her name was Deborah Kemp. Police uh, said they didn't know where she got the strength, but Kemp knows. Her six-year-old daughter, Ashley, was in the back seat in a child's car seat while her mother pumped gas at a gas station. A man suddenly jumped into the vehicle on the driver's side and attempted to steal her car with the child still in it. But he made a big mistake. He forgot about Mama. The 34-year-old mother was dragged on her knees for several blocks as she clung to the door and to the steering wheel of the moving car. She said, I wasn't trying to be a hero. I was concerned about my baby. That was part of me in that car. Well, Mrs. Kemp eventually pulled the suspect from the car and beat him with an anti-theft club device while he apologized and begged her to stop. The car, now driverless, went out of control and smashed into a restaurant, broke a gas line in the restaurant. That's when the child woke up. Mom suffered only ripped pants and, and bloody jeans. And, and knees, the child wasn't injured. The suspect could not walk. One leg was broken, the other fractured. He also suffered head injuries. And he also learned a lesson, the hard way. Don't mess with mama. Now, I don't know if uh, Sarah ever had to deal with someone trying to steal her camel 
while she was watering it and Isaac was sitting upon it. But I know she was a strong mother. And she left a lasting impression on her son. She raised him, no doubt protected him. She taught him important things in life. So I want you to remember as we open uh, Genesis 24, where we've been studying here for a couple of weeks, Isaac is 40 years old. His dear mother Sarah has been dead for three years. He still mourns for her, Scripture tells us. And yet, it's time for him to move on. It's time for him to find a wife. And we have seen his, how his father Abraham sends his servant back to his old homeland to find the right person, the right woman. And God blesses and prospers his journey. He finds Rebecca. And she proves to be the right woman. She proves to be the right person for Isaac. So this week as we approach the end of this great chapter, this wonderful story, Isaac and Rebecca are about to lay eyes upon each other for the first time. Let's pick up in verse 61 of uh, Genesis 24 and read down through verse 66. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lachai Roi and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. He lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. So the servant, along with Rebecca, are now on this 500-mile track back to the land of Canaan. And, and for the first time, really, since Genesis chapter 22, we're back with Isaac. Um, I hope you remember Genesis 22. That's a really important chapter in Genesis, really important chapter in Scripture. Remember that it's where Isaac, as a very young man, and his father Abraham go up on a mountaintop. And at God's command, Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac. But the Lord stops it. It was a test of faith. And that's the last we've heard of Isaac in any detail in the text of Genesis. It's now many years later. Isaac, again, is 40 years old. So we might wonder, what has he done all these years? Where has he been? What kind of man is he? We, we really know relatively little about Isaac among the patriarchs. If you think of, of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, men like that, we, we don't know a lot about Isaac. We, we know much, much more about Abraham we know more about Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau, and of course about Jacob's sons. But about Isaac, there is little. But I think what we have is valuable, and, and it's really precious. Some of the most meaningful things we have about Isaac are right here in these verses we've read. So last week, uh, we talked about Rebecca being the right person, the right woman for Isaac. And she showed that, you might remember, by demonstrating what a servant she was, her, her heart for service and, and how she was willing to go the extra mile and do more than 
what she was asked to do. But now what about Isaac? Is he the right person? Is he the right man for Rebecca? Remember our point that in a biblical marriage, it starts with me being the right person to begin with. Well, the question is, how about Isaac? Verse 62, notice what it, what it says. Isaac had just returned from what we might call a holy place. A place with a strange name, Bir Lachai Roi. The name means the well of the living one who sees me. The background of that if you look at um, where it was named, it's named uh, this way by Hagar. Remember Hagar, Abraham's other wife? Um, and after God had rescued her in the wilderness, uh, she and her son Ishmael, Abraham's other son, uh, she had been banished from, from Sarah and Isaac's home. Well, this became, this place became a holy place, a, a sacred spot, a place where we might say you go to find God. And so Isaac is worshiping God. Isaac is, is now back in Canaan. He's in the southern part of it, what's called the Negev. And he's there because that's where he's supposed to be. That's something that we could just run past and not think about, but I think it's worth thinking about. The importance of being where you're supposed to be. God's people need to be where they're supposed to be and not be where they're not supposed to be. That's just part of it, folks. Isaac was where he was supposed to be. You see, the promises of God to Abraham through Isaac were to be received in Canaan, this land of promise that God had prepared. That is why Isaac is there. It's why Isaac lives there. He is in obedience to God by being where he is. And so Isaac worships God and Isaac obeys God. And then verse 63, what do we find Isaac doing? The Bible says it's evening and Isaac is out in the field Meditating. Meditating. That's a word that sometimes makes Christians uncomfortable. It is a very rare word, this particular word. In fact, it's the only place in the Old Testament this, this word occurs. So even translators struggle sometimes exactly how to render it. There's another word, though, that's much more common that's like a close cousin of it that uh, means, again, to meditate, to think about, even to pray. And it's used several places in the Old Testament. And I, I want you to see how it's used in another place in the Psalms. Uh, this might give us some insight into just what it is that Isaac is doing as he's in this field uh, in, in Canaan. So, for example, in Psalm 77, we have these words, verses 11 through 14. Let me quote them for you, or you can read them. Psalm 77, 11 through 14. The psalmist says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. 
what God is like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. That passage is a perfect definition of what meditation is all about. Psalm 77, 11 through 14. Meditation is, is not some Eastern religious practice of emptying your mind. That's what the world thinks about a lot of times when, when they say meditation, emptying your mind. But there is this sacred process of filling your mind with thoughts of God. Remembering what God has done. Hopefully that's something we have done this morning. Remembering what God has done, thinking about what God has done, thinking about his work, meditating on his power, that's what real meditation is. It's not an emptying, it's a filling. It's filling our mind with God. Do you ever just think about God? Well, you might say, well, that seems sort of a strange thing to do. Why? We ought to think about God and his mighty deeds. And the wonderful things he's done for us. That's what real meditation is. And I, I think that's what Isaac is doing in that field that evening as he prepares to meet his bride. Isaac is a man who thinks about God. He worships God. He obeys God, and in particular, in, in this example, by being where he is supposed to be. And he thinks about God. You see, Isaac is the right person as well. Just like Rebecca, he is a godly, spiritual person. Well, then we have this verse where they first lay eyes on each other. And I know the customs are so different from what we expect with relationships and, and, and so forth. I'm not setting this as the pattern for us, but it's interesting, isn't it, that this is the first time they see each other. They're already committed to marriage. But you almost get the feeling when you read it that uh, it doesn't say this, but could this be one of those cases of love at first sight? The servant tells Isaac all that's happened on the journey. That's verse 66. And then this great chapter closes this way in verse 67. The text says, Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Interesting, isn't it, that the chapter ends with those particular words? So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Wife one time <clears throat> told the following story. She said, one evening I drove my husband's car to the shopping mall. On my return, I noticed how dusty the outside of the car was, so I cleaned it up a bit. When I finally entered the house, I called out, the woman who loves you the most in the world just cleaned your headlights and windshield. And my husband looked up and said, mom's here? You almost wonder, as you read this last verse of, of Genesis 24, how much Rebecca had to overcome the shadow 
of her mother-in-law that she never knew. But it does say that the Isaac takes her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. He marries her, and it says that Isaac was comforted at long last, three years after the death of his mother. Well, mothers, your influence is incredibly powerful and long-lasting. Your presence is longed for. And trust me, your absence hurts. You are irreplaceable. Think about it, guys. One writer said most of all the other beautiful things in life come by twos and threes, by dozens and hundreds. Plenty of roses, stars, sunsets, rainbows, brothers and sisters, aunts and cousins, but only one mother in the whole world. So praise God for good mothers who have always been there. Isaac certainly had been blessed with one in Sarah. And Rebecca, who's just starting into this, you read on in Genesis, she proves to be a powerful mother as well. And lest anyone doubts the importance of a good mother, one who is always there, I don't think we should ever forget that one of the few people who did not abandon Jesus while he hung on the cross was his mother. She stuck it out. She was there. So many of the tough guys ran away with tail tucked between their legs, but Mary was there, and Jesus pointed it out. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for blessing us with family. We know this is your creation, marriage and family. Help us to look to you for the definition of it and instructions for making it work. Thank you for your great example of love, of being a loving father, and of giving us so many examples of wonderful, loving mothers. Help us to understand the importance of being the right people at whatever ever part of family we found, find ourselves. And thank you for giving us family. Even if our only family is the family of the church, we are blessed more than we deserve. Father, today, if, if any find themselves in need of family, in need of coming to you, their great father, we pray you'll give them the encouragement and motivation to do so. Help us to leave this place built up in the most holy faith and ready to serve this week that you're giving us. We pray in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you for listening this morning. As we conclude, we offer the invitation of Jesus. If you need to come this morning asking for prayers or, or help in your walk, if you need to obey the gospels today, well, we just celebrate that with you as you're baptized into Christ, whatever it might be. If we can serve you, help you, we want to before we go. Let us stand. Let us sing.